Wow, I feel like I could just go home now. This was, that was a great job, Miranda. Good morning, good after, good evening. It's been a long day, everybody. Um, and I want to thank Professor Dworkin for inviting me to speak this evening on the topic of strengthening New Jersey through fiscal policy. I've often said that uh, the state budget is the ultimate policy document, that it's not just charts and numbers, it's a roadmap that says, this is where we want to go, and this is how we plan on getting there. And depending on your priorities, each map is different. As Pre President Biden once quoted his father saying, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. In the case of the Murphy administration, we've chosen to use the budget to lift all boats, or as the governor is fond of saying, to create a stronger, fairer, and more affordable New Jersey. And a key component to achieving these goals has been financial resilience. When Governor Murphy was first sworn into office, it quickly became apparent that New Jersey had a tough fiscal road ahead. Among other things, we faced a structural deficit, looming bills in the form of increasing pension payments, a new and increasing school funding formula, and a sizable debt load. When I talk about these challenges, I often bring up the late great Governor Jim Florio, who famously faced similar fiscal challenges early in his administration. In his 1990 budget address, he noted, we are confronted by harsh realities and hard decisions. The time has come to face them and he went on to quote heavyweight Joe Lewis saying, you can run, but you can't hide. History has shown us that politically expedient decisions, particularly when it comes to budgeting, often create burdens that subsequent generations are forced to contend with. There's no better example than the fiscal challenges we faced that were created in the state pension system. Governor Florio and the legislature made tough decisions to raise taxes in order to help meet the fiscal challenges they faced. And the ultimate electoral results, as many of you in this room know, were not good for either the legislature or for Governor Florio. The next administration cut taxes and instead borrowed against the state pension system, a decision we are still paying off nearly 30 years later. Now, it's not news that New Jersey has one of the most underfunded pension systems in the nation. But back in the mid-1990s, the pension system was running so strong, it actually had a surplus. Since that time, however, underfunded and skipped payments by administrations and legislatures on both sides of the aisle created a financial burden that became more costly with each failure to make the full payment. To give you some perspective on the scale of the problem that this caused, had we continued as a state making the full payment every year since that time, rather than skipping or shortchanging the fund, our current payment would be only around $800 million. million. I say only because in order to rectify the mistakes of the past, we are instead funding the pension to the tune of roughly $6 billion annually, with a B, for a combined total of over $25 billion just over the past five budgets. So Governor Murphy, who ran on the promise of fully funding the pension system, worked with his partners in the legislature and has fulfilled that commitment two years in a row now the first time the state has made two consecutive full pension payments in more than a quarter of a century. With regards to debt, the FY23 budget, our current budget, builds upon the sizable debt reduction efforts undertaken in FY22 by making an additional $5.15 billion deposit into the Debt Defeasance and Prevention Fund to support capital construction on a pay-as-you-go basis to help avoid having to issue new debt. We have also dramatically increased our budgeted surplus from the roughly 400 million we inherited five years ago to a record 6.8 billion for the current fiscal year, finally bringing our cushion to a healthy level recommended by budget experts to better protect the state and its residents in the event of an economic downturn. Wall Street has taken notice of our efforts and I'm extremely pleased to say that over the past year, we've received credit rating upgrades from Moody's, S&P, and Fitch, and are now on positive outlook with all three. 
an impressive statistic when you consider that New Jersey has only received five upgrades since the 1960s, and three of those have come in the past year. And it is an independent, and it's, it is, it's independent, these ratings, it's independent acknowledgement of the prudent fiscal decisions our administration and the legislature have made to bolster New Jersey's finances and triple confirmation that the path we set out on five years ago is the right one. This fiscal determination, coupled with more robust revenues, has enabled the administration and its partners in the legislature to transform the lives and financial resiliency of working class families throughout this state. And one way this is achieved is by improving affordability through tax relief. For example, as I hope you are all aware by now, we are in the application process to provide nearly 1.2 million homeowners with just over a million tenants and just over a million tenants with up to $1,500 in property tax relief annually through the new anchor program that we launched in September. By the way, please remind your friends and colleagues that the deadline has been extended to February 28th and encourage them to apply anchor.nj.gov. That enables me to be able to walk into the office tomorrow because if I don't give a pitch to that. Um, we also expanded the earned income tax credit to make it one of the most generous programs in the nation and are now putting more money back in the pockets of more working class families than ever before. We created and then expanded the child and dependent care credit and created the child tax credit so that one of the most sacred aspects of life, caring for our families, doesn't have to be the source of persistent worry. Today, we are contributing also record amounts of education aid to maintain our first in the nation public school status and equally important to help ease the burden on local budgets and keep property taxes in check. The current budget includes a total of $9.9 .9 billion in K to aid formula aid and also advances the governor's goal of universal pre-K with nearly 9,000 new pre-K seats added during this administration. At the other end of the education spectrum, the end that you all are in right now, the budgets have made college free for thousands of students at both the two and four year level so they can graduate free from the burden of insurmountable student debt. In addition to our historic investments in public education, the administration and legislature invested in a suite of recovery programs for Main Street, including a focus on our innovation economy. As a result, we've seen New Jersey's productivity and job growth do a 180 from a decade ago when we lagged behind most other states in our recovery from the recession. And we've been able to do all this while making once in a generation investments to improve our drinking water, combat climate change, and support renewable energy. Making strategic investments with an eye towards the future by supporting clean energy and electric vehicle infrastructure. The South Jersey Windport and the Paulsboro Marine Terminal continue to move forward, bringing with it roughly 1,500 good paying jobs and the promise of a greener future. In the governor's State of the State address last month, he announced that a second wind energy company signed a lease to use the Windport. Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind cites New Jersey's highly skilled workforce and investments made into workforce development as keys to their adding their project to our economy. We're also investing in the mass transit system of the future, including new buses and rail cars, and construction of improved rail stations, bridges, and crossings, which includes the new portal bridge and gateway project. Regarding gateway, I cannot overstate the transformational economic impact of this project, creating tens of thousands of new jobs and ensuring that the economic engine that is New Jersey and the Northeast Corridor continues to be robust for generations to come. We're investing 300 million for the Affordable Housing Production Fund, an undertaking not seen in at least a generation, which will create roughly 3,300 new affordable housing units. Not only is this a win for the impacted communities, it will also mean many new construction jobs. Investments in business and economic development have ranged from assisting Main Street businesses working to recover from the pandemic to larger transformative industries that will help position New Jersey as an economic leader well into the future. Along with wind, one of those industries is film and television, which just this last year brought more than $650 million in spending into New Jersey's economy. 
We've seen major film studios show interest in setting up shop in New Jersey, including Lionsgate, which has broken ground in Newark, and Netflix, which just late this past year in December was approved to purchase a large parcel at Fort Monmouth in order to build a state-of-the-art production facility projected to generate some $4 billion to the state's economy and provide nearly 2,000 jobs when operational. The Murphy administration has been making targeted investments in New Jersey's innovation economy over the past four years, and we're seeing tangible results from these strategic policy decisions. In fact, manufacturing, scientific and technical services, and information sectors experienced annualized growth in excess of 11% last year. According to PitchBook, New Jersey ranked ninth in the nation last year in venture capital dollars invested per state. In total, New Jersey-based innovation-focused companies secured $5.5 billion in venture capital dollars in 2021, which was up 1.7 billion, up from 1.7 billion in 2020. No other state, and we say this every day, no other state in the country can boast of some of the built-in benefits that New Jersey can a consistently top tier K-12 public education, world-class colleges and universities like Rowan University, an enviable location and highly skilled workforce. We often take it for granted, but all of this is a byproduct of budget decisions at the state level, whether they were made a few years ago or a few generations ago. And we're committed to doubling down on smart budget planning and locking in the gains we've made because we're cognizant of the economic concerns that loom each and every day. In recent months, we've started to see that story unfold in our revenue situation. Home prices in New Jersey appear to have plateaued as higher mortgage rates impact the real estate market. As a result, closings on homes have continued to fall and realty transfer fee revenues were down roughly 18% in December 2022 from December 2021. We've also seen dips in corporate business tax and sales tax in recent months. Our economists believe that the moderation in revenue collection growth that was anticipated has begun and could continue through the rest of the fiscal year, particularly during the spring tax filing season when last year's historically high collection levels are unlikely to be repeated. We are watching these trends closely and are committed to continuing smart and prudent budget planning with the hope that these decisions will make our state more resilient during tougher economic times. And while there's still work to do, there's no doubt that because of previous budget decisions, our fiscal position is far stronger than the situation we inherited. And I'm confident that even with the threat of potential economic headwinds, the best is yet to come for New Jersey because our foundation is that much stronger. Finally, before the end, I wanna give a shout out to all of the students in the audience. We need young people committed to public service now more than ever. And if I've achieved nothing else tonight, I hope I've shown you what a difference government can make. And speaking for Treasury, we have internships um, available for students that are interested in public service. So I want to just urge you to look at our website. Our portfolio of responsibilities, as I think I explained to some of you, is wide ranging. So there's something for everyone. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to my office or online on our website and look at what's available. Um, so with that, thank you for having me tonight and I look forward to taking your questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Treasurer. Um, excuse me, just little Marco Rubio moment there, okay. Thank you for getting that joke, that was good, okay. So we had some questions that were submitted uh, online as people registered, uh, and a couple came in uh, this evening when they uh, showed up here, try and run through them. Um, I wanted to ask you just about the overall state of the economy uh, in New Jersey. Today, what would you say are the biggest challenges facing New Jersey's economy? I think, in, and let me know if you guys can hear me, I feel like I'm a little, I think, um, you know, inflation and making sure that, that uh, you know, New Jerseyans, we continue to promote affordability and pr provide relief for people that uh, are experiencing the, the effects of inflation um, 
it looks like from the recent news in the past week that things are looking a little brighter than people anticipated a few months ago. As I mentioned, when we did our revenue estimates, um, our Office of Revenue and Economic Analysis, which does that for the budget every year and throughout the year, um, predicted stronger revenues in the fall with a tapering off in the, in the second half of the year, which we're now in. We're seeing that, so um, that's it's one of the reasons that we've urged building a big surplus so that we're able to sort of handle those headwinds, as I mentioned. But um, we've, you know, we've learned, all those of us who've gone through trying to budget through the pandemic, that it it's, can be very difficult to predict what's going to happen. So the key is going to be making sure we have the resources to fall back on in the event that, uh, you know, the economy suffers some trouble. So just as a follow-up, um, inflation, I mean, can anybody at the state do anything about inflation? That's, that's a global thing, is, right? right? And so right. How, how is the state really, aside from we have a bigger surplus, is there anything the state can do? Well, part of it is the tax affordability, like p p uh, tax policies that try and help um, put money back in people's pockets, the earned income tax credit, child dependent care tax credit. The anchor program will mean, um, could be up to $1,500 for homeowners a year, um, 450 for renters, a um, thousand depending on what your income levels are. So making sure that we direct resources in a way that helps take some of those financial pressures off is important. A question came in that was not about finance, so I want to make sure I got to it, and it was about mentoring. Can you, because you didn't really talk about sort of your career um, and just sort of how you got here. Perhaps can you just share a little bit about how you got involved in political life, and specifically the question, can you talk about the women, we assume, uh, who might have mentored you when you were first getting involved? I've always like probably many of the students here. I always enjoyed government and politics. I always did student government and through school. Um, uh, when I finished college, I wanted to go straight to DC to find a job on Capitol Hill. I just, I've always, I've always loved government. So, um, uh, and then when we moved up here to New Jersey in 1995, um, Having always been involved in government, when issues came up in my small town where I live, uh, I went down to Borough Hall to find out what's the story here. And so I then got involved locally in politics um, uh, and then went to county level government and then to, to state. Um, we had, when I was first in Mercer County, uh, uh, a couple elected officials or women very strong, you know, people, great leaders, Bonnie Watson Coleman, Shirley Turner, who were trailblazers in their own right. So we had examples in Mercer. We had a very open uh, convention process. So that also helps for people. Um, but I also grew up in a household with, you know, all good, the, we're three sisters, the three of us. And um, uh, my mother worked, my grandmothers both worked. We just had a very, I was never, a, there was never a feeling that if there was something I wanted to do, I couldn't do it because I was a girl or a woman. Or um, I think the challenge has been over the years making sure that when you're in office that you're treated. Like I used to, I got to the point where I would say, I'd refuse to answer, I would get asked, you know, depending on where I was in my political career. Uh, how do you do it? Yeah, I have three kids myself. How do you do it juggling, you know, kids and everything? And I said, unless you're asking everybody up here that same question, I am not answering that question anymore. Because every time you treat a woman like she has this extra thing that she needs to consider that none of the men up there have to consider, that little girl out there that's watching that thinks, Oh, this is going to be my responsibility, responsibility to figure this out. This isn't a team effort. This is, it. You know, I, I feel like we have to make sure that we treat our elected leaders and equally. Um, same kind of questions, same sort of, you know, 
respect. And, and um, so that's been something. There are so many more women in elected office now and in, in government. Um, when I first was treasurer, our entire leadership team in, in my front office was all women. And uh, I remember during my uh, confirmation hearing, and I'm going on so much, I'm sorry about this, but during my confirmation hearing, uh, we were all there because it took a few months to get to the confirmation. And one of the senators said, you know, they're mentioning that you're the second woman to be treasurer. What are you saying, that women can do a better job of this than men? And the, all my office is behind me going, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and my point to him had been, it's not that I think they can do a better job. I just am shocked that I'm only the second. It's, it's a shame I'm only the second one after this is one of the oldest positions in state government, you know, treasury. And uh, to only be the second, I think, is an embarrassment. So, um, but it's great to see more women involved, and I hope that continues to do nothing but increase. I just want to ask a, a quick follow-up. Given how busy you are as the, the state treasurer, do Don't you... Ask that. No, no, no. Oh. Do you? No, 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 no. Do you find time to mentor yourself? I try and be. I, you know, sometimes I think the office. You know, people always treasurer, treasurer. They, they call me that. Sometimes I think it's easier to just have a title. So people like they don't have to remember your name or pronounce Moya, which is its own challenge. But um, uh, I think that people can find that intimidating sometime. And, and we have a department of 3,000 people. Um, so I think, uh, so I try and make myself accessible and say if you ever, you know, if you ever want to talk, if you are, I try to encourage people to get involved. Um, uh, so not, to, I don't have the chance right now to formally mentor, but I try and make myself accessible to anybody, you know, to just have a private conversation or learn from, like, my experience, uh, how to get involved, and, and uh, I don't know. But I was, it was heartwarming to hear Miranda say that was great. So I'm, I'm glad I can be a role model for, for, for young women out there, because uh, I think we've had great success in, in looking at uh, Melinda from my office, who's in our comms team. And, uh, and uh, there have been a lot of women that have been part of the success of our treasury years, the past five years, so. Thank you. One of the questions, uh, one of our students uh, wrote, people say government should be run like a business. What do you think about that? Is there a validity to that or, is, or not? I know, I mean, that's always a tricky question because business sounds cold, no offense to NJBIA, and, and, but, um, and the business is here, okay. <laughs> but to an extent, at least from Treasury's perspective, it's important that you do consider it in some aspects like a business because without a good fiscal foundation, you can't you can't do some of the, the, the provide, you know, you also have an obligation to provide, provide a safety net for people and, and all these other obligations I believe we have as a government are much harder to achieve if you don't have a solid fiscal base to work off of. Um, which has been why the, another reason why the credit rating agency upgrades have been so heartening because it shows that the two the progressive policies and fiscal prudence don't necessarily have to be fiscal, uh, mutually exclusive. You know, they can go hand in hand. I think we've achieved a lot over the years. I know, Senator Testa, there's still a lot to do, but, and I want to give a shout out to Senator Testa. He is, you know, he's, he's on the budget committee, and um, so we'll be seeing each other often in the next, in the few months. But um, I just, you know, there's a lot more to do, but I think we've been able to achieve a lot. And it's been thanks in part to having, you know, the fiscal uh, measures that were taken over the past five years. Would you say, because you are the, this, you have the title you have, is the state of New Jersey anticipating a recession in the coming year? And how does a state prepare for a recession? Um, you know, you, you, you've heard this, the governor who, you know, comes from a, a financial background talk about how 
he sees it as a if if there's a recession, I don't think it's going to be the the terrible one that most people predicted back in the fall. Um, that it might be uh, smaller in scale. I mean, just last week, you know, the economic news came out that some people are kind of hoping there will, will be no recession. I know the Fed's increased rates, but there's, it's like they're doing them in more, you know, smaller doses. Um, but how do you prepare for that? You prepare for it by building an adequate surplus that will get you through times like that so that you have something to fall back on. I mean, I look back before the pandemic, we had a budget hearing and building up the surplus has been a goal of ours since the first year, right? Because Moody's and others were recommending roughly 10% of 10% surplus and we were down low single digits. Um, so we'd been trying to build that up and I remember getting a question in one of our budget hearings you know, this is a rainy day. We don't need to save for rainy. This is a rainy day. Um, and, you know, I hearkened back to 2008, you know, recessions and the, the dot-com recession in 2001. You know, this is not a rainy day. You know, that, and little did we know what was coming down the pipe. You know, like our idea of what a rainy day was and then you go into COVID and everything shuts down and, um, you need to be, I think we've all learned a lesson in in you know government that it's that's why it's important to to prepare and and, and you know we go through these we were senator and testa and we were talking to the students about you go in these public hearings and people come in and they they advocate for what they need money for and you hear like all sorts of stories all sorts of different groups um, some heart-wrenching stories you never hear anybody up there with a sign saying, build the surplus. No one's, you know, just picketing for the surplus out in the street. But it's one of those like unsexy but critically important things that as a state we really, we really need to do and maintain. One of, the, uh, one of the charts that people will often look at is the total amount of the state budget over the last 30 years. Um, which was in the teens for a while, and then since the 1990s has gone up pretty in a very steep kind of slope. Why has state spending increased so steadily and so dramatically over the last 30 some years? And is it really just court decisions involving school funding? Well, I mean, school funding is part of it, a significant part of it. I mean, we've, you know, that's been a major piece of every budget. I think I've noted in my remarks, nine billion in state aid for schools um, out of a 50 or so billion dollar budget, yeah, that's a significant amount. Um, billions in a pension payment. So when I, I think I noted 25 billion over the past five budgets has gone just for the pension payment. So, and when you, and that sort of is a, a an example of having grown kind of needlessly because, like I said, if we had been paying that payment every year, it would have cost us roughly $800, $900 million this year instead of $6.8 billion, you know, all that money that we could have utilized for other, you know, other needs. Um, so a lot of it is that kind of, um, those kind of costs that we face and that we, as tempting as it would be to not make the pension payment for some or not, it's critically important because now we've met that two years in a row. We're saving money by doing so. Um, but another, another tenet of the Murphy administration budgets has been investing. And so it's not just making our state operations more fiscally resilient. It's helping residents become more financially resilient, making sure they can get and afford a good education, um, job training, all of the other programs that the state has been investing in, you know, through the support of the administration and the legislature, um, which will make individuals more resilient, um, bringing, attracting businesses here so that there's job growth and that we're positioned as a state, you know, to, to succeed into the future. Um, so 
And, and there have been administrations in the past that like in the recession in, in 08, the thought was we're gonna need to cut our way out of this. Um, we were one of the last states to recover from the recession. This administration has believed more in investment, um, investing in programs and people and trying to um, build our, our eco economy for both individuals and the state through investing. So it has grown, no question about it, but um, there are a lot of very valid and good reasons for that. You've touched on this a few times in your remarks and in the Q&A so far. Uh, we got a couple questions about the pandemic. Um, what was it like to manage the state's economy during the pandemic? And what lessons have you learned from having gone through it? What understandings, new understandings, do you now have about New Jersey? We were talking a little bit about this before we came in here. Um, what was it like managing? Uh, it was a roller coaster. It was, it was, uh, and that's not news probably to most people in this room, especially in the in the back section where the the business folks and folk are. Um, the not by design. You're allowed to sit anywhere, folks. Just watch it. <laughs> the most important people are up front, right? Um, first of all, just from a logistics perspective, we had just dropped a new budget, right? So this is, we're about to introduce a new budget, February 28th, this is typically when the governor will do that. It then, so we spend months putting it together, um, meeting with departments, put together all the documents, he introduces it, it then becomes the, the work of the legislature to then have hearings and work on the budget. We had just put together the budget when the wheels came off the bus in March and everything started to shut down. Um, that year alone, then we had to do three budgets because we had done the first one. We had to go back to the drawing board because our revenues were plummeting. Um, it was decided to do a, a, break it into two budgets, smaller budgets for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, everybody was working from home. We had to make sure everybody got laptops. Just, it was, in, it was, but you all experienced it. Whether you're a student and you were in high school and you all of a sudden had to learn from home at your kitchen table, wherever, you might not have had the technology or the Wi-Fi, whatever. I mean, it's just, it was a learning experience, I think, for everybody. Um, uh, and it was, but it did, you know, I was saying to Professor Dworkin, nobody has ever called state government nimble, um, but that showed nimble. Yeah, it's not like we're not quick to, you know, um, but that showed what could be done. That showed how, how it, one thing I've learned, if you want a, a, thing, a takeaway for me from that, um, as if I needed to learn it after having been there for a couple of years, but the state career employees who work each and every day, they're there before we got there, you know, in, in 2018, they're gonna be there after we leave. They keep government going. They're the ones that really had to adapt and make things work. And they did it, they stepped up. Um, it was incredible to watch. And um, we're very lucky that we have a great public uh, workforce. Um, but I think it did, it, 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 you probably didn't expect that if it was in your high school years that you'd be able to do what you did, learning remotely. We're, we weren't sure we'd be able to do what we did under the conditions we all found ourselves in, I think. And we all learned a little bit about what we're capable of doing um, as both a person and as an institution, so. You talked a little bit about um, support for universities. The administration's been very focused on uh, for certain income levels, free uh, college uh, education. We had a question about approaches um, because there are some who argue that higher education aid should be focused on support for students, that the emphasis should be on things like tuition aid grants, direct support to uh, individual students. Other believe that we should take the bulk of the money and actually give it to the institution um, to be able to allocate, to build any number of different, these are complicated organizations. Do you have a view on this, on which approach in terms of how the state can best support its higher education community? 
Well, first, the Murphy administration has been, you know, both with community colleges and four-year institutions, has invested a lot of money into making those more affordable, um, uh, in, in many cases free for many students. I don't think you can do one or the other, though. I think you have to, whether it's through TAG or EOF, you need to invest, give the students the resources, because everybody learns differently, everybody has a different path, um, and give them the freedom to be able to choose that path and the resources to enable them to do that. But you need universities to have the resources that they also need to do the job when those students choose, this is where I'm gonna go, and this is what I wanna study. You. Our universities need to be able to deliver that for them, and I, it's, they need the resources. So I, I don't think you can kind of emphasize one or the other. I think you need to meet both sets of needs. We had a couple questions about the process of budgeting uh, in New Jersey. Uh, for those who get to take my New Jersey politics class, this is an emphasis for those of you who have not, the students here, I, I will explain to them that the budget process for, say, fiscal year 2025 begins almost the moment that the budget for fiscal year 2024 gets signed and is done, um, that it takes almost a full year. Can you explain to us, now that you've been through it a few times, and for those who don't quite understand, we see budget hearings and think this whole thing is a two-month process. But in fact, it's much longer than that. Can you explain how does the governor's budget proposal that he is going to be announcing in just a few weeks, how does that get developed? What's the process? It's built. Um, right, so I hope you all had coffee, because this is riveting. But <laughs> <laughs> the our fiscal year, right, is not January through December. It's, it's uh, July 1st through June 30th. So the budget passes at the, by the end of June. The new budget year kicks off. Our Office of Management and Budget, usually we have some, you know, there's some tweaking that's done in, in July. Once the budget passes, we make sure, you know, uh, every, the, the ink's dry on everything. Um, and then by early fall, uh, September, they're starting to work on uh, the new budget. So uh, documents go out telling departments they need to start working on their budget, get us our, their numbers. Um, we start in the fall having what we call fish bowls, and it's only called a fish bowl because there's a room at the office management budget, which we haven't actually been in for a few years now, that has a lot of windows. So the idea was it's like sitting in a fish bowl. That's become you know <laughs> the term of art for a New Jersey budget meeting. Uh, so. Each department comes through and they make their pitch and, and we go through the numbers. Um, uh, the documents are developed. They're then introduced. Um, we look at, we have to do revenue assessment also. We have to, because it's gotta be balanced. So we've gotta look at what the revenues have done up until that point. Um, we give revenue updates uh, three times in a year. We, we always have a revenue, um, update with the budget itself. So this is where we predict revenues are gonna go for the year. When the budget, the new budget's introduced in February, because you're they gotta match, you know, what you're budgeting. Um, in February, when we introduce the budget, we do a new revenue estimate based on what we've seen for the past six or so months. How are, our, how are we doing? Um, so we update the number. Then we come back again and we update it in May after we have the April 15th tax returns. So three times uh, it gets, it gets uh, analyzed like that um, and produced for the legislature. When the governor has his big budget message on the 28th, uh, it then becomes the property of the legislature. They take over the budget. Um, typically, the the bulk of the legislature is not meeting during this time. It's only the members of the budget committees in the Senate, which Senator Testa is on, and the Assembly. And they start typically with a round of public hearings. Now the budget is a public document. It's all then online, you know, so everybody can read it in all its lovely detail. Um, so people then react to it. And they will come to the legislative committees and say, 
we would urge more for this. We want more, you know, school aid numbers then come out. We want, we want, you know, we think the legislature should add this, do that. Um, uh, and it's, it's in the legislature's hands then. According to the, they produce the final appropriations document, which just shows where the funds are gonna go. The governor is in charge of certifying what the revenues will be. And that's sort of the balance there. They appropriate, the governor basically certifies what is available to appropriate. Um, they meet with every commissioner for every department through the spring. Um, we go twice uh, for each committee. We go in uh, where the first treasury goes and kind of does an introductory round uh, with both Senate and Assembly Budget Committees. We give it kind of an overview of the budget and take initial questions. And then that's followed by weeks of departments going and talking about their budget, asking questions, verbal questions. We also get written questions from the committees um, and from the Office of Legislative Services. We respond to all those. Um, and then Treasury goes back and speaks again to each committee with our revenue update and fields any additional questions that may be out there. And then the legislature and the governor work together to try and come up with a document that they will approve and the governor will sign and it all comes out by the end of June. Knock on wood, so. Well, you talked about the process, the fishbowl sessions, where you will, may well have, as you're trying to produce your own internal document for the administration, the proposal, conflicting values. Uh, you might have something that this will be a very good policy, but it doesn't necessarily mesh politically. Or th though this might be a good political decision, but it's not necessarily good policy. Likewise, even in those internal discussions, you have contrary demands from uh, members of the administration. The state police need more cars. The, in, uh, the Department of Health needs more help for this, or human services needs more help for that. And you got to decide. How do you make those decisions? Well, it's always, it's always a balancing act, right? I mean, you, you have a finite number you're working with in terms of revenues. Um, the governor, as everybody's heard every year, stronger and fairer. The, 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 those have been the two ideas and more affordable that have driven sort of budget introductions. You know, how, and, and so, Everything is viewed with that kind of eye, recognizing that we have limits, you know. So we're going to hear for, for the next few months about very interesting and worthwhile expenditures that could be made. They're not all going to be get, get to be made because we just, you know, there are certain things we need to make sure, boxes we need to check in terms of surplus and other needs. Um, so it's a balancing act to, you know, the, it's, it's, the governor proposes the budget, but he usually says when he introduces it that this, he knows it is not going to be the same budget in June that he's introducing on February 28th. That's because, you know, the legislature is going to hear cases made for, you know, expenditures and savings in their meetings. So it becomes their document. They will then you know, work with it themselves. So it's it's not just a balancing act within the administration, it's then a balancing act that we all have to collaborate on together with the legislature to get to the final document, so. You touched on um, this a little bit, but hopefully you can elaborate a little more. Are there any number of reports that say New Jersey is a high cost place to operate a business? that our tax climate doesn't compare well to other states, to neighboring states, and yet we continue to see businesses move here and, and stay here. So what makes these businesses come and stay in New Jersey since presumably it's not the tax climate? Um, first of all, it's well-educated workforce, which is always in one of the top, top things that site locators are looking for when they, um, great 
school system, again, ranked number one just recently, um, K-12. People want to move to a place and set up businesses where they won't, they'll be able to raise their families. Um, and uh, we're in a great location. We're in, you know, in the Northeast Corridor. It's an economic engine for the country. And, and you put all of those things together, it, it kind of helps explain why companies continue to locate here. And we continue to you know, increase our business filings for new businesses. We continue to grow millionaires in this state. Um, and and you know, it's, it's, it's has so much to offer that uh, I think that's why you see so many businesses continue to come here. We have a traditional question that we end all of our guest speakers, uh, we ask them to answer. Uh, and this is it. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you were an undergraduate in college? So much, so many things, but <laughs> I think that I think um, I would tell myself the road isn't necessarily going to be a straight road. You're going to if anybody had told me as a modern European history major in college that I was going to be state treasurer of New Jersey 30 plus years from now, I would, I would have been, what, are you kidding? I mean, you're just, I would tell myself, just continue, so I would tell myself that. Don't, don't get hung up on, this is my path, and this is how it's gonna be. Be open to possibilities, um, and never stop learning. You're gonna think you know everything, but you're gonna meet people who know more about certain things than you do, and you should learn, and always have your ears open and listen to them, uh, listen to their perspectives, listen to their life lessons. S schooling doesn't end in the, when you leave the classroom. Just be open to that, um, uh, but enjoy these years, because you, you don't get many chances to be able to sit and learn and, and, and have that experience, so. On that note, let me thank Treasurer Ms. McMoyo. <laughs> for a wonderful and insightful conversation. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, again, for those of you who can do so, we hope you'll be able to join us at the RIPAC Gala on Friday night, March 10th. Until then, everyone, thank you. Have a safe trip home. And thank you, Treasurer. Thank you.